Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 761st New Social Environment. I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Sumeya Valley, Aya Al Bakri, Joaquin Pissarro, and Jennifer Stockman. We're thrilled to welcome poet Precious Okuyaman here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we're on the Nape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of, of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today's hosts. Jennifer Bly Stockman produces feature length documentary films on artists and the art world. Her current film, Nam Jun Pike, Moon is the Oldest TV, premiered at Sundance in January, 2023. Stockman is president emeritus of the Guggenheim and was its president for 15 years. She's a founder of Dementi, which brings digital and web three fluency to the more traditional art world. Stockman is a partner of Global Museum Strategy Group, and she's been an avid collector of contemporary art, including NFTs, since the 90s. Art historian, theoretician, curator, and educator Joaquin Pissarro is director of the Hunter College Galleries and Burshad Professor of Art History at Hunter College. He has held positions at the Dallas Museum of Art, Kimball Art Museum, MoMA, Philadelphia Museum of Art, among others. Pissarro has served as the editorial director of Wildenstein Publications and is the author of numerous books, most recently Wild Art with art critic David Carrier. Pissarro is a consulting editor for the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to Jennifer. Well, it's really an honor to be with you all today. And I have the pleasure to introduce two amazing leaders who are actually defining the Saudi art and culture scene as we speak. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate both Aya and Sumaya for the extraordinary success of the 2023 Islamic Arts Biennale. And I'd be remiss if I also didn't congratulate Prince Bader, the Minister of Culture, and Rakan al Tuk for their far-reaching, brilliant, and ambitious vision for the arts and culture sector in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Aya al Bakri is the CEO of the Daria found a Biennale Foundation and charged with launching not one, but two first ever international Biennales over a two year period. The Contemporary Art Biennale was launched December 2021 and was curated, you might recall, by Phil Tenari in the Jacks district of Daria and received glowing reviews. All of the work uh, done for that Biennale was through the pandemic period, making the outcome even more impressive. And just this January, I was instrumental, obviously in launching this Islamic Biennale at the Hajj terminal in the Jeddah airport. And I look forward to seeing it in person next week. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in global communications from the American University in Paris. Samaya Valley is a South African architect and a principal of the award-winning architecture firm Counterspace. She is best known before this Islamic Arts Biennale for being the youngest architect to be commissioned the internationally renowned Serpentine Gallery in 2021. Her work is called A Whole City Under One Roof and Just Brimming with Ideas. In 2022, Valley was selected by the World Economic Forum to be one of its young global leaders and as a Time 100 next list honoree. Uh, has, she's been identified as someone who will shape the future of architectural practice and its canon. In April 22, Samaya was appointed to the curatorial team for the first Islamic Arts Biennale, which is why we are here talking today. And it is, it is, again, just such an honor for me to be with such a brilliant group, including Joaquin, who has so much experience in so many areas. Um, I think the first question should go to Aya. Um, and I, I just am personally overwhelmed that you have, you have overseen now two successful Biennales. 
uh, which have both been so ambitious under the Ministry of Culture. And when I, when I first heard of the plan many years ago, I couldn't imagine it would happen, but they both happened very successfully. But maybe you could tell us why these two global events were even created from the get-go and, and maybe describe their missions to us. Hi, Jennifer, thank you. And thank you all for such an amazing session. Um, I'm, I'm really happy and pleased to be here with everyone. And, uh, and thank you for your kind words. I mean, if it weren't for the Minister of Culture and his support and the ministry, uh, I mean, there is no way these projects would have happened. But, um, and obviously, Rakan Tog, Vice Chairman of the Foundation, His Excellency, uh, gave us tremendous support as well. So we're very, very grateful. Um, so these, I feel like these two biennales are like um, two different, I mean, kind of, I, I would say two different siblings under one home. Uh, they're, they're meant to, they're, the, the idea was always to kind of put Saudi on the, on the cultural map. So whether, um, so the first, the first biennale being the contemporary was in Dari'ya to kind of put Dari'ya being the actual, the actual um, Saudi capital. Uh, the former Saudi capital, um, putting it on the map uh, with a contemporary show was very, very, very important to us. And then obviously the Islamic Arts Biennale um, played a different role being in Jeddah, um, in the in the pilgrim uh, terminal that we repurposed as a cultural center now. Um, I feel like these two kind of are, are play their own role um, within, in, in the country when it comes to when it comes to arts and culture infrastructure. So it's not only about only contemporary art, but it's also about kind of really having that dialogue with um, contemporary art or modern art or historical objects, et cetera. So the foundation is meant to kind of cover all that ground in order to, to, to speak to, to, to a local and international audience. Um, so that was basically the idea. And the, and the foundation does these two biennales, but within these two biennales, we do a lot of educational programs, a lot of public programs, um, community engagement, really to kind of nurture this and make sure that we kind of talk to our audiences. Um, and we've, and, and, you know, we're very grateful that, for instance, the Islamic Biennale's attendance has been through the roof. And we've, uh, we've just even, you know, reached more than 270,000 people, visitors um, within the last month and a half. So we're super, super happy with, with, with the impact um, of this amazing, amazing show that was artistically directed by Sumeya. Uh, you know, the visitors keep coming back and asking questions and are super kind of uh, excited to understand more about art and artists and the way that this ecosystem, you know, is growing. Um, and that's exactly why we do what we do under the foundation. So it's like this kind of merge of, of international exhibitions um, with a very important kind of and substantial um, uh, public program, which is like a very educational program that caters to different audiences, different age groups, um, different topics. So over, we do over six, five or six programs a day um, throughout the duration of the 90 days of the biennial. So it's quite heavy, a kind of a, a, a heavy kind of marriage, I would say between these two. Yes, and the and the uh, people you're able to bring over to Riyadh has been extraordinary for the panels and for your educational program. That's a really important point um, because just to have a biennale without the education is is lost often. And it's wonderful to look at some of these slides. Um, I was fortunate enough to get uh, in December 2021 to the Duria Biennale. And it was extraordinary. We're looking actually at a Richard Long right now. I, I just remember that and he's recreating yeah. it. It was destroyed after the Biennale and he's recreating it soon, I hope, we all hope. Yes. Somewhere in Riyadh. So that's very yes. exciting. But I'd love now to just ask, before I turn it to Joachim for some questions, we both have so many questions for you, I and Samaya, but um, before I turn it over to him, I would just like to ask Samaya a question. And it, it's really about how, um, if you would explain to our audience how you believe the definition of Islamic art 
might change as a result of your curatorial vision for this Biennale. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's so wonderful to be here. I'm a huge fan of the platform and I believe so much in the work that it does. So I can't thank the team enough for having us here and for giving us a chance to talk about this work. Um, it's an honor to be in, in all of your company. And thank you also for the question. I think it's a really important one um, because for so long, I think the definition of Islamic arts has been handed down to us. It's, it, of course, there is a very strong existing canon of Islamic art, and it's been defined and redefined throughout the ages since, I believe, 17th century France. And that definition has oscillated around geography, around chronology, and around style and aesthetic practices. And I think as somebody who is of the faith and also someone who's very much interested in the future of contemporary art and the future of shaping cultural typologies from voices of difference, uh, you know, to think about how we can decolonize uh, museums, biennales, spaces for, for the public realm that are interested in engaging with arts. I was thinking about how we can create a biennale that is going to put forth a definition for Islamic arts that is resonant with our lives, resonant with our lived experiences and practices, and perhaps that doesn't only focus on style and aesthetic traditions, but that really looks at the philosophies coming from the faith and thinks through what they can offer for the future of not just Islamic arts, but the future of art practice. If we think about Islamic um, practices, uh, I often say if we think about African practices and African ways of being as well, our practices are oral, they're oral, they're performed, they're rooted in ritual, they're rooted in, um, in being around community in coming together and gathering. They're not always only about built structures and built forms. Um, they're not about static forms of preservation. They're about lived, living and, and breathing practices. And this is something that we really wanted to put forward in this Biennale. And I hope that I hope that we have, because so many of our artists have really worked to interpret these themes and to take them on. So what we have in the Biennale is a series of experiences. We have both historic objects, we have archaeological finds, and I must say that um, we have an incredible curatorial team. I curated the Biennale alongside Dr. Sada Rashid, who's an archaeologist from Saudi Arabia, Dr. Julian Rabi and Dr. Amnea Abdelbar, both of whom are exemplary Islamic art scholars. And throughout the Biennale, we have historic objects and archaeological finds juxtaposed and in conversation with contemporary experiences. And what we really wanted to do was to situate experiences and practices in a lineage of, um, you know, we wanted to give them a home by situating them in a lineage with these historic objects. And we also wanted to give the historic objects a relevance and a future by showcasing them with, with experiences. So I hope... I hope the Biennale puts forth a different definition for Islamic arts, one that is really relevant for our lives, resonant with our practices, and is created in the in, in the image of, of us from within the face as, as a manifestation of our identities, which I believe is so important at the moment, but also as a welcome and as an open hand to anyone who wants to learn about the faith as well. Thank you so much. Um, I think that conversation, this conversation alone could go on for a long time because it's just fascinating. But I, Joheem, I know you have a lot of questions for both Ayo and Thank Sarah. you, Jennifer, yes. Um, it's, you're absolutely right. Well, first of all, welcome to you both. And thank you, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to co-host this uh, extraordinary event with you. Um, it's, I haven't seen the Biennium, would love to see it. I've read a lot about it. And, uh, and the more I read about it, the more I'm uh, interested and eager to see it. So I hope this will be possible soon. But um, I have a question which is perhaps uh, um, sort of tangential to, to what we discussed so far. Most of, our, um, most of the members of the audience probably 
are not familiar with uh, the population in Saudi Arabia. And when you look at the demographics of the population, so it's a country with a, a very young country with less than 40 million people, which is about the average population of any country in Europe, most countries in Europe. But what is very unusual, if not unique, is the fact that out of this population of 40 so uh, million people, you have uh, between 70 and 80 percent of the population who are less, younger than 30 years old. So you have an extraordinarily young audience and public. And I'm wondering, uh, Sumaya, Aya, the question is to both of you, uh, how, how that has inflected your practices or impacted your uh, choices, your uh, general philosophy? I would you like to go first? Samaya? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, yes, for me, absolutely. It's been so incredibly inspiring to work with the energy of a country, as you said, that is that has such a young population. And I think, um, and this is, I think I'm speaking here first and foremost about the incredible Diria Biennale Foundation team um, under the helm of the incredible Aya al-Bakri. It's been amazing to work with a team that is so open to thinking about change and that is also unburdened with the, um, th there is no, burdensome expectation around what Islamic arts is, what it should be, what contemporary arts is, what it should be, how sh how things should function on a systemic and structural level. So that has been absolutely amazing. I think what the team has, has pulled off, what the foundation team has pulled off in such a short time in terms of its contribution to shaping the culture of arts in Saudi Arabia, that is absolutely immense. And it is, I, I believe, largely because they are not burdened by the feeling of impossibility or the feeling of you know, being trapped in old structural systems. So many times um, as a group, I think we talked about uh, certain things and everybody said that will never happen in time or that's simply not possible or no one's going to understand this definition of Islamic arts. But I think in each case, we can say that that was completely overcome and absolutely not true because we have been so conditioned by the systems that we have that we're unable to imagine systems differently. And the, the energy of having a population, a culture and a team that is young and ambitious cannot be, it, it, I can't overstate how, how imperative that has been to the change that we're seeing and, and also I'm, I'm genuinely deeply grateful that this definition of Islamic arts is now in the world and, and that has been enabled entirely by this team. And because I believe they have the energy of uh, youth and of ambition, of change and of revolution. Before I, I give the, the, the mic back to, to, to my friend and colleague, Jennifer, I, I want to, to expand a little bit on what you're saying because it seems to me that uh, one of the major, there are, I mean, as Jennifer said, so many topics, and we won't be able to exhaust everything by the end of this session for sure, but it seems that the, the relationship, the maybe tension in a way, the dialectical tension between history and present and future, as you just said, is really uh, very present, in, even curatorially at, 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 the, at the core of the selection of the objects. If I uh, go by my uh, notes, so there are 280 historical objects, which is interesting in the context of a biennial, next to 60 newly commissioned objects. We just saw one with Jennifer's image. The, uh, oh no, sorry, this was uh, the Richard Long was, sorry, the previous biennial. But I'm, I'm curious about uh, this marriage of sorts. You, you used the word yourself, Sumaya, between uh, history, present and future in a sense. Um, yes, and I think also there's something to note in how cross-generational the team is as well. My, mm -hmm. Myself being the youngest and um, learning from, uh, from people who are really schooled and very knowledgeable in the field of, of Islamic arts as well. Even though we have over 250 objects, which is, uh, you know, a, a wealth of objects and artifacts from all over the world, many of them from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as well, Objects are, um, you know, they're, they're of a small scale and all of our contemporary artworks and installations 
are quite large, which is enabled by the scale of the space that we have. So it doesn't appear to be overwhelming in terms of the experience of the Biennale and, and um, the presentation of objects. And when we get a little bit further down in the slides, I hope that will be visible as well. Um, but every every experience in the galleries is really rooted in uh, responding to historic objects that we have on display. And the historic objects were not only chosen for their um, aesthetic and artistic prestige, they were also chosen for their ritual significance. So we have incredible um never before seen objects in in you know in a, in a museum or in a biennale context for example the door that was on the kaaba itself the center of our rituals um and i think there's something really important about being able to situate these in a in a narrative and alongside contemporary objects because it really roots them in the present it it reiterates their significance in our present day lives and in our rituals. What we're looking at now is um, a series of archaeological finds from Dr. Saad Rashid's incredible research on the Derb Zubeda Road, which was the largest pilgrim road ever constructed. And we present these in the reception area of the Biennale, for example, alongside a work by Ahmed Martyr, um, where he's talking about people who have serviced the pilgrims. And in the background, we can see the historic Hajj terminal. So we're really thinking about how this specific site and the city of Jeddah has always been a place of welcome. It's always been a place that's been synonymous with cultural exchange and cultural production, just by virtue of the fact that it's gathered people from around the world in that place. And like that, as we move through each gallery, we really start to see the historic objects come to life uh, with the contemporary commissions as well. And many of our artists collaborated with and um, uh, you know, consulted Dr. Saad, for example, on his research in the making of their works. This for me has been very important because what our artists are doing is they're making a contribution to the archive. And many of them are thinking about archival practices differently. Here we have a work by Joe Nami, for example. It's called Cosmic Breath, and he's choreographed the call to prayer from 18 different locations where one wouldn't necessarily expect the call to prayer to be called. So for example, um, a parking lot, a gas station, the side of the road somewhere from across the world, Japan, Durban in South Africa, Detroit as well. And uh, he's recorded these and choreographed them so that the call starts at the same time or the, the verse of the call starts at the same time. And this is really reflecting on the idea of cosmic breath, that every second of the day, the call to prayer is being called somewhere on earth because it, it moves with the movement of the sun and uh, there are five a day. So when we stand up in prayer, we're joining this undulating rhythm and this undulating call. We're joined really with people who do the same around the world. Just an example of a form of archival practice that perhaps has not been, uh, you know, so 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 many of our practices are not able to be held in traditional archives because they're not written forms. They're they're spoken, as I said, they're oral oral. They're passed down from from generation to generation, from body to body. And many of our artists are really taking on these practices and interpreting them. In, in contemporary artworks, but really deeply inspired by historic objects and and, and historic practices. Mm -hmm. Good. So, um, I, I would just like to add, as, as someone who's had the opportunity to spend some time in Saudi Arabia over the past three, four years, um, the, the culture, as both Samaya and Joachim alluded to, is, is so youthful and so spirited and so enthusiastic about all these plans that the Crown Prince has for its 2030 plan. I, you know, just in my experience anywhere in the world, I've never seen such enthusiasm. And it's do to the young people who are so inspired and engaged with these new ideas. I truly believe 
Saudi Arabia will become the model 21st century country. I would say Riyadh is the 21st century city, but I think there's so much happening in the country at large on the east, eastern side, on the Red Sea, in Jeddah, uh, in Al Lula, that uh, it's, it's really widespread. Um, the other thing that I just, and this is going to, going to end up being a question for Haya uh, or Samaya. Um, you know, I'm very curious about how you chose the artists because to me, Islam is, it's not just about Saudi Arabia or one specific country. It's widespread and consists of many, many different cultures. And to weave these cultures together into a story that you've created in the Biennale is quite magical. So the, the question really is how did you choose the artists from around the world? And um, how did you integrate all the different Islamic cultures of sound and smell and you know everything is involved in the culture? Thanks so much, Jennifer. First, I just want to say I couldn't agree more with your sentiments and I've been saying it everywhere that I've been speaking as well. I really believe that the region has the opportunity to shape the future of culture differently, and it's doing that. It's really working to integrate different models in the way that they're they're practicing and creating, and, and that's been extremely inspiring to be around. Um, on, the, on the topic of how, how we selected the artists, so I think this is something that... Um, has been a huge responsibility because this is the first Islamic Arts Biennale. And at the same time, we had to think about opening up the definition of Islamic arts, but we also had to be somehow universal and resonant with Muslims around the world. And so the rituals and the themes that we chose to work with are really things that all Muslims um, believing, non-believing, or, you know, people who are of the Islamic world or who have resonance with it will immediately recognize, uh, like, for example, the call to prayer, the way that we come together around food and certain rituals, forms of gathering, and so on. So the themes really allowed us to appeal to uh, Muslims around the world, I think. But then within that, we wanted to showcase that there's a diversity of voices, there's a diversity of forms of practice. And somehow, despite that diversity, or perhaps because of it, because Saudi Arabia, for example, has been such an excess of cultural production through the pilgrimage, we really resonate with each other, no matter how diverse we are, no matter how, where we are in the world, whether people have been to the center of Islam, whether they've been to Saudi Arabia or not, they've been affected by it in their lives. And we selected artists from around the world. We also selected artists, not because of their faith or because of their background, but because their method of practice has something to do with the Islamic faith. It, it, it embodied in their method of practice is something that is resonant with the faith. We're seeing here, for example, work by, an, South African artist Ikshan Adams, who works very collectively. These tapestries are woven with a group of women. Um, the subject matter of his work is Islamic, but there's also something of a meditative nature in the way that he practices and this rep rep repetitive action of, of, of weaving is also a kind of spiritual practice. So we chose artists who have something of a spiritual nature that comes from the faith in their practice, for example, something that's meditative. We chose artists who work with um, things that are, as I said, oral or oral or have a kind of ritual in their practice. We also chose artists who work collectively, who work with others. We chose artists based on their philosophies in relation to the faith, for example, somebody who's interested in ecological practices that are to do with the faith or are to do with how we can think about ecology differently. So yes, we really chose them based on their method of practice. And on the subject of geography, we wanted to work with artists who, as much as possible, are hybrid in their ge geography. I am South African 
but I am of Indian heritage and I'm also Muslim, which is complicated for an Indian. Um, and I live between London and Johannesburg, but I am Muslim and somehow we've carried practices from Saudi Arabia throughout our lives. We, we stand up in prayer every day to face the Kaaba in Mecca and our, our um, practices of generosity and hospitality, so many things in our lives are really resonant with practices that have come from the kingdom. So we also chose artists, sorry, last point, who blur geography and who are hybrid in their practice, who are able to resonate with many different conditions. I'm so delighted, uh, Sumaya, if I may jump in, that you chose actually an artist. I was actually two of them, just two also who happen to be from South Africa. But uh, I was curious to hear your, you speak about the, the, the piece by Ikshan Adams. Um, I don't know whether that's the right pronunciation, but you, I think you didn't mention the fact that the support of these uh, works is actually old secondhand or used prayer, prayer mats. Am I correct? And, and yet they seem to be, again, I haven't seen it uh, face to face, but they seem to be glistening or they seem to be a very precious uh, surface to it. And I was curious about that uh, uh, tension as it were between old and, and new, or between low and high. And maybe you could uh, uh, say a few words about that if you, if you yes. don't mind. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the question. So if Sean's work, you're right, it's, it's base and source material is from, prayer carpets he's collected from his home community in Bon Tehirville in Cape Town. And often Ikshan works with um, sites that are loaded. So for example, he in some of his practice, he's worked with floors from sites of forced removal in South Africa, and he stitched them together to form a meditative prayer carpet. In this work, um, his intent in the beginning was that he would collect these carpets that have been in families for generations and he would stitch them together in a kind of in a kind of communal gathering um, of bodies but when he collected them he couldn't bring himself to to cut these really precious carpets that had been in families for generations so what he did instead is he worked with um, the imprints of the markings and of the bodies and we saw that in the slideshow uh, a little while ago and uh, he, stitched, he stitched together a new tapestry for each carpet with a collective of women that he works with in his studio as an homage to these bodies who have really uh, come together through their faith against apartheid in very difficult conditions over generations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, alongside that, the other work from South Africa that you mentioned is by Haran Gunsali. In this work, we see a thousand cast hats, and it's about the funerary procession. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I'm, I'm wondering for for our audience whether uh, it is possible to go back to. We saw the image about five or six uh, slides ago, and I don't know if it's easy to do. Yes, exactly. That's the number fifty nine. Yep. And then if you can get a close up on them, they're quite sensitive. There we go. There we go. So these are actually cast, are they not? Um, yes. Yes, it's extraordinary because everybody thinks that they're fabric from the photographs and even if you stand next to them, they you have to touch them to know that they're not. Um, so really very painstaking, meticulous casts. And as I said, again, something meditative in this process of, of casting them. But this is about the funerary procession of a man named Imam Abdullah Harun, who Harun is actually named after was an imam and a community and religious leader. He spent a lot of time in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and that really influenced his ethos and his way of being. It influenced also his politics. And he was an extremely loved person in South Africa. His funeral was attended by 40,000 mourners when he was very sadly killed by apartheid police. And this work is very prescient because at the moment, the trial of Imam Harun is currently happening in South Africa to persecute um, his killers. And in this work, we see these hats, which are um, a reflection of a fraction of the, of the people who gathered to, say, to pay their respects and say their, their last goodbye. And we hear an audio piece with narrations from the Imam's daughters and 
poetry about his life and the impact that he had on his community. And this work really is about the idea that beyond our daily prayers and our forms of worship, every interaction that we have in our lives is also a form of worship. And when we die, that's what we leave behind. Um, and the consequences of our actions is really, you know, this, how do we leave behind a better world? It's a, it's a truly moving and beautiful work. And thank you for, for singling it out. If, if Jennifer allows me, I will just ask one more question because it segues exactly to what you were about to say. And then I want to hear what Jennifer will have. There's so much again to say. Is that is that okay, Jennifer? Of course. So I just want to to to, to reflect on what you're saying. And we Jennifer talked about the uh, the, the the component of uh, the Islam within this biennial, which of course this is the first biennial, the first Islamic biennial in itself. It's historically determining. I actually want to segue on this and and mention the. The spiritual, which is what you were just describing here, the other artists we probably cannot go into details, but Mohanan, Mohanan Shono, the letters in light, lines that we write, which is a reflection of the personal journey through the spiritual, the Basmad Felemban, the wave catcher, which is a reference to the Adhan, the call to prayer. So, so we could go on and on, but uh, would you, want, I mean, that's, to me, uh, I cannot think of a single Binial, um, 63 years of age. I've been to Binial since I was less than 10 years old. I cannot remember any Binial that has had such a, a rich spiritual content at the core of it. Am I, do you agree with me or am I wrong here? I think it's, it would be unfair of me to agree. <laughs> but thank you so much. That is such a huge compliment to our team and, and, and thank you. We hold that deeply. I think there's something to be said for um, art being interwoven with spirituality and that has been taboo, I think, in, in recent years and in the kind of secular era that we're in. But if we think about the roots of artistic practice, they are tied to forms of worship across religion, even if we think about pagan times and you know very much before enlightenment it's always been a part of artistic practice and if anything I really believe that these worlds and these philosophies can contribute something different to the world of art so so we should absolutely have more of it mm -hmm. Beautiful. thank you and and knowing Sumaya um, a bit uh, who is herself a very spiritual person. I think it, she manages to <clears throat> communicate that very well in the uh, Biennale. Um, but a question for Aya. Aya, you've been quiet for too long. We can't let that happen. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to know why you felt, and your team, and Prince Bader, that uh, the uh, Biennale construct was the right medium to share these views on Islamicism to the world. This is, you know, because there's never been an Islamic Biennale before, I think it begs the question, why now, <clears throat> why this format? Why call it a Biennale? I know this question has come up to you before and you've uh, been very thoughtful about it. Thanks, Jennifer. I think, I mean, I don't know where to start. I feel like the main reason is because, first of all, it's such a show, nothing nothing of, of this scale or concept has ever been done except for maybe the Islamic Arts Festival that happened in the, in the 1960s, I think, in, in London. Um, and it was a year-long festival and it was, apparently it was beautiful. Chris Durkan says it was, it was amazing. And nothing of that sort has ever happened again. And I feel like, as, as a Saudi country that's been kind of, is the, that's the cradle um, of Islam being, you know, between Mecca being, for instance, you know, as Jeddah being between Mecca and Medina, um, it, it only makes sense for us to be hosting such an important show that's super, um, it's very much relatable and very, and very important to us and to the Islamic country. So the idea came about uh, when Prince Bader was signing an ISESCO agreement and um, and he wanted uh, there he wanted Saudi to host something that's very inclusive and that works with all the institutions that have been in the forefront of collecting for so long, like the Benaki or you know the 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 VNA or 
um, the Louvre with with collecting a lot of Islamic arts, and he wanted to do something where he where it's different and very very much close to where we are and who we are, um, and kind of how Saudi's been serving the two holy mosques um, is really important to also kind of highlight because as as a country we've really been working really hard at you know. Um, I, I mean, everything to do with the Holy Mosque, with Mecca and Medina, with the expansion of Mecca, with, um, I mean, there's a lot of storytelling that, that, that happens that nobody really knows when it comes to Mecca and Medina. So I feel like that's a lot of, there's a lot of things that we were, we, need, we needed to say. And I think the best language or the best dialogue to have is to say these things through art, because I feel like art is a whole other, is, is a language on its own that you need to learn. And I, I, I think spirituality also is something really, really important because people mistake Islam or religion with, you know, just a, a ritual practice only that doesn't come with spirituality. But, you know, yesterday, one of one of my friends was having a was was touring on her own in the Biennale and she went and um, stopped. I, I, I saw her from afar um, reading about the Wa'al Shawqi work in front of the in front of the work. And then she stood there and just sobbed because she related so much to the work. And this is someone that, you know, your, your average visitor that's, you know, cultured and, and, but they connect to the work very differently. And that's something that I feel like only we can do because of where we are and, and, and how, how, how impactful Mecca and Medina have been um, for our culture. So, and civilization. So whether it's actually in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia, or whether it's, it's only in Islamic Bain Ali, but there is so much culture intertwined um, if, if, if not only spirituality or religion or food or, you know, so many different things. So I, I, I feel like it, 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 it makes so much sense for us to be hosting such an amazing Bain Ali. And I feel like it really, after we opened, it showed how much sense, how much sense it made. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, certainly the reviews and, you know, from what is being uh, spoken about have been extremely impressive and extremely positive. So I think uh, you're on to the right thing. And this will reoccur every two years. Is that right? What is correct? So, so the ne so next year we, um, we work on the contemporary, Diraya Contemporary Biennale um with uh, our curator who will be announced very soon and um the year after we do the islamic arts biennale again in jeddah at the Hajj terminal and hopefully include more institutions in um in the show whether it's in the main exhibition or in the uh, al madar which is the kind of uh, the start of this this idea that prince Badr wanted to really kind of show um include different institutions within within the biennale so for the future, we're meant to work with different institutions and give them bigger spaces, whether it's pavilions or bigger spaces, to be able to contribute or curate their own, um, to curate their own shows with Islamic artworks that they've been collecting for, for years. Very interesting. Um, Joheen. Can I jump in and just, I mean, you know, I, I feel like uh, it's, it's wonderful, by the way, to see this uh, cycle of images uh, behind uh, our backs when we, as we speak. Yes, thank you. Some, some more. And I, actually, this is a perfect segue to ask Sumaya a question. We, we could list the number of boxes where this is a first, the first Islamic biennial, the youngest biennial, probably the one with the youngest director, um, and, and on and on. Um, what I'm actually interested in, in turning to you for is the fact that you're not, I, you're, I mean, you're not a usual curator in many ways, but you're definitely not a usual curator in the sense that you're, you come from architecture. You are a practicing architect. I believe you are still a, a principal in counter space. Am I correct? And I, I believe that you said, I mean, you, you were in an interview quoted to say, and I love that, that quote, counter space was born out of a desire to create a different canon. Well, that different canon is very much, it seems to me, the way you've applied that concept to this very biennial itself. But I'd like to, to turn to you to, to, to ask, uh, there, it's not frequent to see a director of a biennial uh, come from the world of architecture. How has that inflected your own selection, your own views? Uh, there are some pieces that I, are particularly moving to me, like the recreation of certain mosques out of very fragile materials such as bamboos or palm trees and so on. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm, I'm really curious about 
you expanding on how architecture has shaped your vision? Um, yes, thank you for the question. I think it's um, it, it's certainly not the core of my practice to be a curator, but my practice has always had a research and pedagogical endeavor since the very beginning. And I also really believe that in order to change the future of architectural practice in canon, we need to be able to expand the remit of what we include in, in architecture. And so I, I have often worked on projects that are not really considered hardcore architecture. I often work in the artistic realm. I have a lot of um, urban research and um, artistic installations. I also practice as an artist. And I think that working as a curator has been an extremely pedagogical experience. The closest thing I have done to it is teaching, where one really writes and sets out a brief and a framework, and then the process of also working on the commissions with the artist. In that process, not only is the artist developing a project, but one is refining one's own perspective and, and bodies of research. And um, if you like, we can skip over the videos um, in the slideshow. I don't know if it's distracting anyone or, or if it's okay. It's interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I like it. Okay. And then um, it shows the serpentine pavilion, which you design, which counter space designed, and which is where you you were particularly highlighted in this okay. project. So sorry, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. No, no, no worries, no worries. Thank you. Um, so yes, I think I think there is there are certainly works that are spatial and architectural in the Biennale. You mentioned uh, two, two of the mosque projects, one of them by Scene Architects, who is a collective from Riyadh that is really specifically focused on Najdi architecture and on architecture from the region and what it can offer for the future in terms of how we think about sustainable futures and ecologies and how we think about how we preserve heritage and, and, and lived practices. Um, and that work, as you said, is um, inspired by the Prophet's first space of prayer, which was not anything ornate or the image that we have of mosques today. It really was created with palm fronds and was, you know, disintegrated and disappeared entirely into the ground, touched the earth lightly. It was a space that was made by rituals of community and by people coming together in that space. And that for me is an architecture that's different. It's putting forth an, arch an, an architectural future that's different. If we think about the mud mosques of Jena in Mali, they, they did that as well. They're still doing that. They're thinking about how we can preserve heritage, but not in a static way, in a communal way where everybody comes together through this festival to remud the mosque year on year. And arguably, it's the same mosque that has existed over hundreds of years, but each year it's new and it's collaborating with the seasons. There's a form of community practice in how it's made. Many of our architects and artists, Yasmin Lari, the other architect you mentioned included, were inspired by this idea that also is very Islamic. How do we preserve in a lived and breathing way? And I believe as an architect that that can offer something for the future of architecture. I also believe that it can certainly offer something for the future of artistic practice. Here we can see, um, and Chloe asked me to include these, some of my own work that is also inspired by these very same ideas. Um, and I think that this perhaps has come from not, not only my position as an architect, but my position as an architect who wants to shape the future of practice and canon differently. And, and I'm particularly interested in how we shape the future of cultural typologies differently. And a Biennale is really a site for making the future. Um, I also think that the experience of this Biennale is very narrative. And it's also, a lot of the works are large scale installations. So it's been really amazing to be able to work as an architect on envisioning these, uh, the, the, this narrative and these large scale works as well. Um, and I think that we should also, all of us that should acknowledge that there's 
so much to be learned when we collaborate with different disciplines. And for me, one of the most incredible things on the project has been these collaborations with our artists. It's also been the collaboration that I've had with my co-curators, all of whom come from such different disciplines. And I think that my practice as an architect has been deeply enriched by this process. Hmm. I don't know if you noticed the smiles on, on several people's faces, the humor in this letter from older Sumaya to younger Sumaya. Both, both Jennifer and I pulled brilliant out piece. our iPhones to, 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 this is absolutely yes. brilliant. Are you saw, I was taking a picture, yes. <laughs> Me too. And, and what, a, what a perfect segue. I mean, Jennifer probably sh should and yeah. must have the, the last word, but I love the fact that number 23 is poetry is a necessity as an introduction to our coming poet who will conclude. But Jennifer, please. Yes. Uh, well, I'm curious. Um, I, I believe that the um, this Biennale was really meant to attract Saudi's own population rather than focus on tourism, although it's it's a positive thing for tourists to come and see it. But maybe you could talk a little bit, Aya, about the demographics of maybe, and even compare the Daria Biennale of Contemporary Art, since we'll look forward to that next year, and who, who is coming and who's interested and what what is your objective? Uh, do you want it to become a destination for tourism the way the Venice Biennale is and so many Absolutely. of the other art events around the world are? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the 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 focus is meant to be for both. Where we are, I mean, our our aim as a foundation is to do a cultural exchange or you know cross fertilization. We want the international visitors to to see the works that Saudi that Saudi is doing as a whole, but also what Saudi artists are are doing um, and their practices. That's something really important for us. For that, a lot of curators um, came came to see. So, I. I I mean, our day-to-day -day audiences are definitely um, the Saudi population and the locals, but we have had a, a very large number of international visitors um, who visited at the opening, who, who, who still keep coming through different, um, whether it's entities or as guests of some of our uh, friends of the, of the ministry, or, you know, your regular, you know, visitors that book online and just grab a ticket and come in. Um, we've had actually a lot of international visitors. If, if, if anything, I think I think the percentage is quite large um, of international visitors, but they just they just come segmented or you know um, groups all together. Uh, you know they come to Jeddah and then they go to Al Ula. So uh, no, actually we've been getting really really good uh, visitors, and we're still going to get a lot more. A lot of people are aiming to. Um, visit uh, w while visiting the Formula One as well. So any 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 event that's happening in Saudi brings a lot of other visitors. But the Biennale is always the first stop, thankfully and gratefully. So um, I feel like the, the the demographic is growing for both um, for both international and local. And I think we need we 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 have to we have to keep growing that as we go. If we go back a few slides, there were some images of, of some pilgrims um, at the Biennale. And I think this has also been something incredibly special. On a day to day, we really yeah. have a cross section of Jeddah visiting the Biennale. And, and, and we have so many families, we have so many young people who are visiting the Biennale. We also have so many old Schools. people who are visiting. Aya told me recently that the one thing that the team has been asked for repeatedly and that they have to keep buying is wheelchairs um, because yes. there are so many families and so many young people who come and then choose to bring their grandparents a little while later. I've heard this from many friends as well. And it's really a kind of active place for Jeddah. I think people are coming to hang out, to see each other, to meet, and then there's art in the background, which for me is so incredibly special. And the other group that we have that's been really special to witness and be a part of is uh, pilgrims who are coming for Umrah pilgrimage. And uh, the Biennale Foundation has actually organized it so that as they land in the Hajj terminal across the road, they, 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 they are shuttles that come over and they have a special tour that is you know, objects and artworks that are particularly related to the pilgrimage that they're about to go on. This is incredibly special. For me, when yeah. I 
first saw this and when I when I, when I first engaged with the site, I realized that my parents could be our audience, my grandmother could be our audience, my nephews could be our audience, my nieces. And this this is something that is is so moving. And to expose audiences like this to art in a way that's not intimidating because they're familiar with the content is something that's so impactful. Wonderful. Thank you, Sumaya. And actually, just, just to reiterate on Sumaya's point, a lot of these pilgrims also visit to, while heading back to the airport, the pilgrim airport. So the, the reason we keep buying these wheelchairs is because a lot of these pilgrims are also old um, uh, and, and still make it a point to stop again at the Biennale to see the art and then head back home. And I feel like that's that's so, that's so beautiful that we're always that we're that we're part of their 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 journey. Well, it, it's so brilliant because Muslims from all over the world make this pilgrimage. Right. And to just go to Mecca or Medina mm -hmm. and then home, you know, this is a way to further educate them, further expand the uh, their experience. Uh, yeah. So I think the whole idea of putting it at the Haja airport is, or the terminals is just brilliant. And I think going back to the very sources of Islam, right? The, the, the journey of the prophet and his followers from, the, from Mecca to the Medina, from the holiest city to the city of light is absolutely preponderant. So there's a full kind of circle, it seems to me, from the very birth of Islam to uh, the mi mi migration, the, the he try. I'm sorry. Forgive my pronunciation, but the reference to uh, that uh, uh, migration, the number of canopies you've seen as well, is so symbolic of uh, of that particular aspect. And I noticed Gary Schwartz was was referring also to the um, uh, to to the diaspora, which we we tend to forget is so immense throughout the world. Was it 1.1 billion people or 1.2? We don't know from from Spain to Indonesia, you know, covering all continents. Uh, the, the director herself is from South Africa, and you know, it's, it's, it, we forget how diverse, incredibly diverse, the Islamic population is. And this is, to me, a, a great salute to this uh, incredible diversity. I don't know if uh, Aya or Sumaya want to conclude with this, or maybe say a few words. Aya? <laughs> Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. There are almost 2 billion Muslims uh, that have, I mean, oh. by census, I'm sure there are many more. There are also beyond that many more people who may not identify as Muslim, but who are of the Muslim world, who grew up in these cultures, who are resonant and familiar with that. One in two Africans is Muslim, which is also a, a statistic that people are often so surprised by. And I think to have a Biennale that is speaking to these, speaking from and to these voices and opening up the definition of Islamic art so that, as Aya said, you know, we can really start to understand and appreciate what the Islamic faith actually is and what the roots of it are and who its people are. There's been so much misconception about Islam and putting this forth, I think, in a generative way has for us been very, very special. Lovely. Jennifer? Uh, well, I, you know, I know we're opening up soon to questions from the audience, um, but Samaya, who, who have been your major inspirations, um, both from the Muslim world and the world of architecture? You know, I'm thinking Zaha Hadid, but I, I don't necessarily see a strong connection between your work and her work, but I'm very curious to know how you think about that and where you go for inspiration as well. Mm. Um, where I go for inspiration, the, the letter that uh, was on the slides is, it's, it's a letter to my younger self, but it's also a love letter to Johannesburg. And I believe, I mean, I believe this very much about Johannesburg, but I also believe it deeply about Jeddah now. And I believe it about so many Southern conditions. I think there is, architecture, there is art, there is design form, there is design thinking that is waiting to happen from our contexts and from our practices, from our lived experiences. And that is for me, first and foremost, the biggest inspiration that I have. But I think that figures like Zaha Hadid have been absolutely um, 
inspirational to me as well. I often think about architects like Zaha Hadid, like Bal Krishna Doshi, like Noguchi, like Sir David Ajay, people who have had very different um, experiences compared to perhaps uh, the, the canon that they inherited. And they created from these experiences entirely different visions. All of them are very different. And you're right that perhaps there's not necessarily a formal connection to their work and my own. But what I do find incredibly inspiring is that they somehow found ways to bring those worlds into being and, and to, to take their experiences, to take these different perspectives and to translate them into vision. Thank you, very interesting. Chloe, do we, should we continue asking questions or should we open it? We Never can open it. Or I <sighs> I'm so, so thankful to the four of you for this incredibly generous um, and enlightening and illuminating conversation. Thank you so, so much um, for all of your, your dialogues and everything you've shared today. We do have a few questions and I encourage those of you in the audience who have a question to post it in the chat or to raise your hand. The first question is going to be from GE. GE, feel free to go ahead and ask directly. Thank you so much, Chloe. And thank you all for such an expansive afternoon. Um, it's taken me in so many places that I think are so necessary. My question is, is it the aim of the Benali to help establish art as an aid and support to the spiritual life, tracing the creative act to its ultimate source, kind of inner knowledge and baraka or grace, which might, uh, which can make the crystallization of inner realities in form and space and time possible? I know that's a big question, but that's where I was going, taking this all in today. So thank you. Um, I'll start with our Biennale and this theme, and then I'll hand over to Aya uh, to talk about the bigger mission of the Biennale itself. But yes, thank you so much. I read that in the in the chat actually, and that's such a, a uh, generous and, and thoughtful reflection. I hope it can be true. I think it's absolutely in our ambition and our aspiration to think about how we can work with art to bring people closer to um, their faith and, and to their practices. But for me, and I, I think this also um, connects with questions of decolonization and so on, it's been very important to be able to work with philosophies that come from the faith to put forth how we can think about the future of um, art practice differently. One example is, for example, some of the dilemmas we've had with the historic objects. And, and Aya is very aware of this as well. When we first started to have a conversation about bringing the Kaaba door into the Biennale, for example, we were, you know, there was concern about how this would be, uh, how this interfaces in a Biennale or a museum context, because part of what we do naturally is we want to touch the Kaaba, we want to touch anything associated with it, because we believe that there's a baraka in that. But in the museum world, that is, of course, something that's frowned upon. So I think that what also the, these, these small things and these things throughout, throughout the Biennale have really been able to offer us ways to think about museum practice itself differently. So, you know, how uh, we, we now are thinking about how things are a lot more interactive, a lot more how we have a lot more direct contact with them, how the integration of sound and performance happens in the Biennale. Many of the artworks themselves have been invitations for other artists to create performances and activations. So there's a generosity in them as well. We saw an image earlier of um, a table that's an artwork by Lubna Chowdhury, for example, that is uh, inspired by rituals of breaking fast from around the Islamic world. And that table is actually actively used and programmed throughout the Biennale. We've invited 
scholars um, who have research on the migration of food species. We uh, have invited an artist also to uh, work on a performance on the table and a gathering. And so I think these things are things that come from lived practices, but they can also offer a contribution to the future of arts. And for me, that is something that's been very important about this Biennale. Aya? No, I totally agree. Uh, I think Sumaya um, kind of explained it perfectly. And I think ab about your point, Sumaya, about the museum practices and the way that we try to protect the works. So we were thinking of a different way that people can actually interact with the works without having to, you know, cover it with glass or, or you know, so we tried to just, you know, change the height, um, put some, some barriers a little bit so people can come close to it without ruining the works. So I think we changed, like you said, Sumeya, the, the dynamics of how these, the museum world works when it comes to, to the artworks. And we tried to make it super close and super relatable, whether in concept or, in, or physically um, to, 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 to visitors. Um, and I think the aim of the Biennale is, uh, the larger aim is to really, really kind of write the narrative of Islamic arts in, in whether it's in historical objects or contemporary works or, or you know, having, and I think naturally that adds a very spiritual layer to, to all the works. And, and, and if art is meant to move you, then that's the best way to move you. Um, and I feel like, I feel like, yeah, that's, that's the larger aim. And I think spirituality comes within. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question, G. That was an amazing question. And thank you for those answers, Sumeya and Naya. Uh, the next question will come from me um, and it's for Sumeya. Um, I am wondering, has working on this biennial, bi biennial impacted how you approach your work at Counterspace and how, if so? Um, yes, of course. I think fundamentally every project becomes absorbed into the practice and, and shifts it. Um, and that happens in a practitioner's trajectory for better or for worse sometimes. And I, I can't say how grateful I am to have been given the opportunity to work on this project, this project of this immense scale and with this incredible team. And so many, I think there are so many things that I will take forth not only in my practice, but in my life. I really think that it's now, fortunately or unfortunately, like a thesis that, that will just continue and, and will be present in every other project that I do. Um, and I think that this is important to say because the impact that a platform like this can have on a practitioner's life, on a young practitioner's life also is immeasurable. I hope that we can say the same for many of the artists that we worked with, that, that this experience also has become a moment in their trajectory that will, that will positively shape their contributions for the future. For me, I think the most impactful thing has also been the idea that work like this is possible and, and being able to see this Biennale realize to be able to work with this incredible team and to understand that we can actually shape the future of culture differently. That for me has been really profound. Thank you so much for that, for that response. And the last question today is going to be from the Rails publisher and artistic director, Fong H. Bui. Fong, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Joaquin. Thank you, Jennifer, Jumaya, and Aya. It's very fascinating hearing you undertake this monumental, courageous effort. Um, it's super complex, I must say, because in 2008, prior to the crash, Alana Heis and I was going to do a huge um, I would say, survey of art from Asia. It will take over the whole entire MoMA PS1 and half of MoMA. It never happened because of the crash, but we travel extensively to 14 country, several months. I think ended up at least visiting 100 
plus studios from everywhere, from Shanghai, you know, to Beijing, all the way to Singapore, to Seoul, elsewhere. And uh, what was so interesting to going back further, uh, hearing what you've been discussing, I can't help but to think in my interview with Ai Weiwei, you know, I spent a few times in Beijing, in New York, and elsewhere with him. And it's just bring back to the very beginning of June 4th, 89, the Tiananmen, you know, Tiananmen Square episode, the tank man, who I think was the most important pertinent symbol at the time, how it evoked the desire among population of young people, young, young generation, to, to be unique individuals in a way. And I, in the course of talking to Wei Wei, I said, you know, Wei Wei, you are the personification of the tank man in the art context. Because in 2000, you probably all remember, he created a very controversial, coinciding with the uh, Shanghai, the third Shanghai Biennale. It's called Fuck Off, you remember? The series mm -hmm. of photographs with fingers, oh, yeah. <laughs> right oh. in front of the White House and all the world famous monuments. And it was called uncooperative -co attitude. It's very interesting. Asking avant-garde artists or artists who participate, making work that does not in any way assimilate to what they were being trained from the Bozar tradition or the Chinese traditional tradition. All of it. Uh, and it was interesting in the sense because in the context that we should be remind ourselves that Edward Sae, very important book in 78, mm -hmm. Orientalism. It was a very important text, controversial, you know, when it came out. And it's essentially trying to, you know, share that it's been an inaccurate cultural representation of the Middle East, that at least he argued it's occidental but it's all ultimately uh, really dictated by Eurocentric certain form of prejudice against Arab and Islamic culture and so on. So it's very complex the way I'm trying to reframe my question here, but I know that in the interview with Barbara Water, with Xian Jemin, right after the incident of June 4th, uh, he couldn't answer directly whether the tank man is to be found, how we can trace what happened to him. The reason I'm asking this, because we all here was very perplexed by the disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi during the Trump visit, you know? So the question is really something that we already know. There's been, has been a bilateral relationship between uh, Saudi Arabia and US. I mean, that started in the thirties. It's been an ongoing complex relationship. We know that. Question is, as we are lover of art, lover committed individual to facilitate culture um, as a advanced form of, I don't know, certain kind of liberated mean through, through the made object. You know, as Shirley say, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Poet, poets and artists always work together. So my question ultimately is how much, you know, liberty, how much freedom, because we know art and politics never mix. It has tried in Nazi Germany, it didn't work out that well. Same thing can be said with Soviet Union, you know? So it's a different world, you know? There's Islamic absolute monarchy. And then the where we are in the US, it's a really a secular constitutional republic representation. So it's a very interesting where we are now. So how much is it that you all have the freedom to undertake to do what you do curatorially without anyone else in the governmental level, you know, dictating, sharing, telling you what to do? It's a loaded question, sorry. Question. 
Um, thank you so much for the question. From a curatorial perspective, the, the client for the project is the Diria Biennale Foundation. Um, and Aya can speak a little bit more to the setup and, and where that sits within the Ministry of Culture and alongside it. From a curatorial perspective, I think that there have been intentions from the Ministry of Culture around, uh, for example, discovering and working with collections in Saudi Arabia, around working with other Islamic institutions and around facilitating international conversation and exchange with those Islamic institutions. But curatorially, and uh, I, I don't really feel that there has been interference in terms of the creative thinking around the Biennale as a whole. I think I really wanted to be very mindful that Islamically, uh, everything that we're doing is is in line with uh, scholarly thinking. And we also had a process of co consultation with religious leaders, which was very much about the validity and the accuracy of content, not necessarily about uh, the creative and curatorial vision. And I also will say, and I'm very glad that you brought up Edward Said and Orientalism, that there has not been a Biennale or a definition of Islamic art that has existed like this in the world before. Mm. And it is extremely, extremely brave of the Diria Biennale Foundation and of the Ministry of Culture to put forth this vision and to support this vision for, for Islamic arts. And I can say that I can think of many, many contexts where my own artistic vision and, and direction for this Biennale would not have been accepted because it's completely outside of the existing canon that we've inherited around Islamic art, which is often extremely orientalized, as, as you've said. And uh, that, that's what I will speak to in terms of the level of involvement of the ministry. I think that I felt extremely enabled in terms of bringing this different artistic direction and this different definition of Islamic arts into the world. Well, that's super, such a good response, you know, and I, I also want to follow up also in the the unique role of the, the interplay between the person that belong to the social construct, the fabric of the family and the social context. In other words, the uniqueness of the West have always been put a greater emphasis on the individual. Mm -hmm. And on the East, it's the opposite. We belong to the collective. We're yeah. not supposed to be, uh, you know, invested in the search of unique individualism. In other words, <laughs> I mean, I think I find it so fascinating how the Chinese government, who at the same time, uh, trying to uphold, maintain such a strict Leninist, Maoist discipline, at the same time, open up this liberalization of the economy of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, so in other words, I believe in recognizing Wei Wei, you take anything, you take, for example, his 2010, you know, uh, millions of painted sunflower seeds that was feel the turban hall at the tape. To me, that is no more, no less what he had absorbed from what Maria Earthroom when he was here, living in New York. He would make it hugely massive, you know, showing this incredible scale, you know, exceeding anything imaginable visually that we can really comprehend in the West. And I think the Chinese communist government will reawaken, reaffirm by that kind of massive scale in their cultural thinking. So it's very unique, the justification, the struggle between the uniqueness of individualism and what it means to retain the collective sense, whereas an individual doesn't exist in Hinduism, in Muslim, you know, in Buddhist, all the form of religious teaching in the East. So it's just very complex and interesting. So whether that's a question or not, we don't know. <laughs>
but I thought I just share that interest and perpetual concern uh, for my own own self. So I'm from, you know, Asia. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. I think that's at the heart of what we're saying, that there are different ways of being waiting to happen from different perspectives. And the, the one that you mentioned about the collective is really important as well. And it's something we certainly hope we carry through in the Biennale as well. Aya, you have any further comment following what Shumar just say? I think Sumaya, I think Sumaya explained it so beautifully. Um, and uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Thank you for being here on our SE. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Joachim. I give it back to uh, Chloe to introduce our poet. Thank you so much, Fong. And thank you again to Jennifer, to Sumeya, to Joachim, and to Aya for this incredible conversation. At The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a reading, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Precious Okoyaman, to the stage. Precious Okoyaman is a poet, artist, and chef who stages sculptural topographies composed of living, growing, decaying, and dying materials, including rock, water, wildflowers, snails, and vines. For Okoyaman, nature is inseparable from the historical marks of colonization and enslavement. Numerous key galleries and museums have featured Precious Okoyaman's work in solo and group exhibitions. If you'll all please join me in welcoming Precious to the NSC. Thank you so much for reading today. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. This was an amazing conversation. So happy to be part of it. I'm going to read a poem for you today from my upcoming book, But Did You Die? I wrote, I started writing these poems to the sky as prayers. Um, this is one of the first in the series called Sky Songs. Sky Song, give your body for abstraction, bite your tongue and eat it. This is a corrective therapy. Now into one alienating and alienated, ah, now into the meat of the world. Don't speak to me in obscurities, recreation stripped down, carry nothing but light, only light, no longer clutch to guaranteed space, but recreate space, temporalize space, the universe as adapting space, a love that gives space, a love that is palatial and self-immolating, become the room, let the silence undo you, now release into the morning light, Life rubs up against matter, inner core against inner core. Try not to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. No to the fragility of language. No to the ego. No to the colonial context of thought. No to fake tenderness. No to liberation without destruction. No to self-destruction. No to masters. The light washes the body clean lay throbbing in the sky, to live affixed to the circuitry of the world. The body is pinned to the sky in blue, reborn in this energy, caught and released, lucid, intangible realities of dust. The sky sweeps it all away, regulate the unconscious play of the mind. Have you ever seen Pink Moonlight? It's frightening. Thanks, everyone. Wow. Wow. Oh my gosh. That was incredible. Thank you so much. Hear it from your, you know, from your soul. It's so meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Precious. That was amazing. And thank you again to Sumeya, to Aya, to Joachim, and to Jennifer. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making daily conversations like this one possible, and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like this platform, our daily NSE. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., join us for a rail reading, Buenos Aires in New York City with the world in between with Juan Arabia and Patricio Ferrari. And as is real tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you again to all of our speakers and readers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sunaya.
My reading, Bye. Precious. Thank you. Thank you, Precious, for the reading. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sumaya. 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 Thank you, Sumaya.